Hi, my name is Sergeant Jim Wagner. I'm a law enforcement officer in the United States. Many of you know me from my many DVDs and articles I write for Budo Magazine. And I'm here today because I'm introducing a friend of mine, Sergeant Uri Cafe. Now all of you know I teach the reality-based personal protection system based on law enforcement, correction, military units, and of course the martial arts. Now there's many people out there teaching what they call Israeli martial arts. And there's a lot of instructors out there. However, many of these instructors have never been to Israel. They've never been in an Israeli military unit. They never have been an officer there. And so a lot of these people are phony. Well, the man, Uri Cafe, and the sergeant, Uri Cafe, is not a phony. How do I know? Because when I was in Israel training for the Israeli government, he was one of the guys I hooked up with. I've trained with him on military bases. I've trained with him in police stations. I've trained with him at the Tel Aviv University. And this guy is the real deal. And what he's going to teach you dealing with Israeli uh, firearms disarms is going to probably save your life if you're ever confronted with a criminal or terrorist. So I hope you enjoy this DVD and is definitely reality based. You! Hey, to the car hey, right hey, now! Hey, stay right! Yeah. <laughs> don't move my seat! Hi, my name is Uri Cafe. I'm a current Kapop instructor in the United States for the last two years. I've studied under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chaim Peel and under Major Avin Ardia from Yamam Israeli Special Forces Anti Terror Unit. Today in this video, we're going to show you the principal guidelines and features of uh, weapons disarming. Uh, part of our system, CQB, which is a military uh, term from, for close quarter combat, part of our uh, tapes that we're going to include today would be disarming a weapon, a firearm, mainly pistols, but we're also going to talk on the difference between weapons. As like I said before, it's part of our system, part of our uh, mo modern martial arts training. We had a few, we got few guidelines that we're going and we're sticking to those guidelines. Pretty much is like our mottos. It's rather be a student of reality, the master of illusion. And also another term that we're using is it's better. It's better to be uh, a student most of the time, and sometimes just to be a teacher. Pretty much for that tape, we got another motto that we're going to stick to is a firearm will run out of ammo. Edged weapon will not. Part of our martial arts training is to make a difference and to evaluate the weapon to see what we can overcome and what is going to create a problem for us. And in this video, you will see the principle and also it's going to break a lot of myths about a lot a lot of other systems that you would actually see and you would be easily it would be easy for you to identify mistakes as far as weapon disarming and in other martial art and you would identify the mistakes according to our current guidelines. Okay, we're gonna start talking about the seven principles, the seven guidelines of gun disarming. The first rule that without it, everything else is no significance at all is the field of fire. The field of fire is something that I will emphasize all the time. We got to keep that first rule. If that rule is not established, then everything else has no use. It's, it is the core of every technique of a gun disarming, stepping out of the field of fire. I will start in a very uh, submitting po uh, position when my hands are up, not like so. I want to keep them close because from here I got to operate the technique. I got to have I have to have my hands close to my body. The next the next stage is clearing out the field of fire. First guide rule: move my body out out of the way. I don't know what kind of projectile is it. That's why we call it field of fire, not line of fire. Maybe it's a fragmentation. Maybe it goes everywhere. Maybe it's a single projectile. I do not know that. Got to keep my other hand clear and out of the way. You can see also as I divert Mark's hand, I give him a little bit of a pull and get him out of balance.
Okay, let's continue to talk about the field of fire. Stepping out the field of fire, like I mentioned, it's the core of the technique of any gun disarming we're going to perform today. Okay, starting again from a position, my hands are closed towards my body. I have to operate quickly from here. I don't, I don't have time to raise them up. From submi submissive position, non-aggressive position. I'm going to step out, feel the fire. It's important to check that all my limbs are tucked in and not in the way. I give my attacker a slight pull. As I reach up, I block the hammer from striking the firing pin. Turning inside my attacker's body. Now, as you can see, even if a misfire uh, goes, it would go directly into his body. If not, my thumb is always going to be in the way between the firing pin and the hammer. The most significant part is to get out of field of fire, blocking the hammer or creating the misfire into his body. Later on, I can add knees, head butts, elbows, shoulder bumps. But before that, the guideline, step out the field of fire, trapping in. You can either trap or discharge it into his body. Okay, let's talk about what not to do. You'll see a lot of those techniques are performed in Israeli martial arts that uh, pretty much can get you killed by not understanding and not keeping the field of fire. Even if you stepped out of the field of fire, you gotta maintain to be out of the field of fire. You don't wanna go back into the field of fire even if you stepped out of it. I'm just gonna demonstrate now what not to do. As you can see, I stepped out and got back in the field of fire. Mark is on the ground, but I'm directly in his projectile line. Okay, still staying in the field of fire. Another common mistake is after I'm out of the field of fire, is attacking the guy and making a lot of mean faces and elbows. What you're going to accomplish by that is a very angry person on the ground holding a gun at you. Okay? Second of all, we emphasize in our system to open palm strike. By open palm strike, I would achieve safety of my own hand. Pretty much, if I hit with the knuckles and I get marked right in the head, most likely I'm going to break a finger or a knuckle. In the tactical thinking, it's not really smart sin since I need to operate most likely that pistol or any other weapon for that matter. And I want my fingers in handy. So by just punching the guy, creating him to fall on the floor, it's not going to make me any good. Again, what not to do. <coughs> and I got shot. Okay, still in the field of fire. We're going to talk about the field of fire is being diverted away from me by either a distraction, by my attacker, whether it's a terrorist or a criminal, going in a bus, going in a plane, any possible scenario possible or from by a third person coming into the area. Okay, field of fire, as, as of now, shifted from directly towards me to a third person or to another source. In that case, when a gun is presented from this side, all I have to do is take that time in order to perform a snatch and a gun retention. By saying gun retention, I'm gonna keep the slide not close to my body, it might get caught in my clothes or any other tactical accessories. If I'm a, if I'm a law enforcement military member, I'm gonna keep the slide sideways, keep my hand as a shield, keep my leg as a shield, and from here, I can release the shot. Again, distraction come from the other side.
Okay, let's go back about the field of fire. I gotta control and maintain the field of fire here. As I step in, we got another common system of diverting the line of fire or the field of fire, stepping out as I go in and turning inside with my hip. Now, this is a good technique. The false, we found it, and some um, bad points, again, is a good technique, but there's few bad points, disadvantages, more likely, is that here, I got the power of one thumb compared to all four fingers. Also, the fact that the thumb is placed right here gives me the ability to control the trigger here, the trigger guard, the hammer, and the slide much better because, like I said, four fingers are better than one thumb. Okay, so the same technique, instead of here and getting closer, tap, block the hammer, if I can block uh, the trigger guard. Also, I got control over the magazine. I got a magazine well right here. As soon as I press the magazine releaser, the magazine is going to drop. I, might, I still might have a bullet in the chamber, but now I eliminate the possibility of 10 or 15 rounds, depends on the, on the weapon itself, to one chambered single shot. Again, stepping out of field of fire, coming from above, and stepping in. I got the option of dropping the mag, I'm blocking the hammer with my thumb, and my grip is much stronger. Okay, we're going to talk about the second guideline of weapon disarming. Number two, understanding how to use the weapon, understanding the weapon itself as a mechanism, and how to utilize it. There, is, there are many we weapons out there. Rifles, as you can see, shotguns, handguns, revolvers, pistols. Every single one of them is an individual and a different mechanism. In order to do a proper weapon disarm, you, we got to understand the mechanism of the gun, identify the mechanism of the gun, and according to that, we got to respond. If I'm going to respond to a shotgun the same way I'm going to respond to a pistol, I might be in a lot of trouble. Different mechanism, different reaction for me. Field of fire to every single one of them. That's the main, the main um, goal I want to achieve is stepping out the field of fire. But in order to do that, to go to the second stage, I must understand the mechanism of it. Because it's a mechanism, I can create a malfunction. A mechanism got to have some kind, of a, some kind of a system inside in order to keep it flowing every time over and over again. Knowing and understanding that mechanism, I can control the way I'm going to jam it and create a malfunction. Unlike edge weapons that they never jam since they're one big chunk of cutting metal that never runs out of ammunition. In guns, in any weaponry in general, all of that is canceled if I know to recognize and to understand the proper mechanism, identify it, and according to that, to, that, to react. Okay, we're going to talk about also not just the mechanism itself, I also got to understand and identify some kind of accessories that are on the weapon. One of the most common accessories is the sling. Sling is used to carry uh, the rifle, as you can see here, connected all the way uh, from the bottom, from the stock, up to the barrel. I'm going to utilize the sling in order to perform a takedown technique. And the finish. Okay, we're still in a mechanism of the gun, identifying a mechanism of the gun. As you can see, Mark here is pointing a pistol, a semi-automatic pistol at me. Now, the thing about pistols is it's got an uh, independent slide. The hammer that drops on the firing pin is actually go what's going to cause um, the fire. Everything is going to start by Mark pressing on the trigger. Now, what I'm going to uh, talk about right now is a suicide drill, as we call it. When everything else fails, you know the guy is serious, you know that it's your only way out. Um, pretty much um, the Russian style of it is by pushing forward and attaching the wrist. 
Now, if Mark here is going to press the trigger, you see the hammer is still cocked back, but it doesn't go off. Why? Because the mechanism of the gun, the slide just jam the springs that are in charge of dropping the hammer on the firing pin. Okay? This is a very risky situation, a very risky uh, way to do, to perform the technique. It's a Russian system. Back in Israel, that it's not really popular. We don't like it just because of the simple fact that I don't want a full loaded gun pointing really close and tight into my body. Therefore, we choose another option, especially if I got a little bit of a distance and I see the guy's intention are serious. What I'm going to do pretty much from here, I'm going to grab the wrist to fix his hand in place and at the same time jam and slide forward the slide. As I do that, I might get shot in my hand, but that's the sacrifice I'm going to take. And quickly as I can, I'm going to slide my hand onto the chamber and at the same time holding and fixing his wrist in place. Now you can see as Mark is going to press the trigger, nothing is going to happen. And from there on, we're going to carry the techniques. I'm going to demonstrate in one fluent motion. Hasta la vista, baby. Okay, let's go through the movement and analyze pretty much what I'm going to do. Again, this is an unrecommended suicide technique that with any, everything else fails, this is most likely what I'm going to perform. As the guy, the guy points the gun from a distance, I want to step out, feel the fire, jam by sticking my hand into the barrel. As I do that, I fix his wrist in place, sliding down the slide all the way. He presses the trigger. You can see the hammer is not going to go off because of the slide being pulled backwards. Wave field of fire, ballistic arch towards him. Now in any given moment, I decide to let the slide go. If he doesn't pull the trigger, guess what? I'm going to help him out with that, but this time it goes straight into his body. Okay, another variation for the same drill, the suicide drill. Again, highly risky, but if everything else fails, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Feel the fire and jam right in. You can see he's trying to shoot. He's pulling the trigger. Nothing goes off. Straight in. Now, if the trigger is a, is a problem, is, a, is an issue for me, I can go straight for a wrist break. You can see I fix here the hand. His wrist is squeezed against mine, and I create pressure breaking the right wrist. Another option for me to do is just slide sideways and have the gun straight in my hand. Okay, let's go back to the rifle, analyzing the move and usage and utilize of the sling, a common accessory most rifle and assault rifles have today. Stepping again outside to feel a fire, holding at all times, controlling the barrel. Switching hands. Getting inside, softening my target, softening my target, going nice and deep into a sling choke. Taking a step back, if the guy is tall, kick the knee fold, maintain control as I choke inside. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about what not to do. Again, going back to common mistakes you see in another uh, and plenty of other Israeli martial arts, again, by not understanding the mechanism and body posture, I can get myself killed instead of survive or save myself. We're going to talk about a very common position, a very basic one, a gun threat directly to the head from the front. Okay, we'll see that technique very often. As you can see here, my groin is fully exposed. Okay? If I'm standing here, I pop it up, 
I expose myself. All Mark needs to do is get me on the ground and pretty much execute me right there. The third mistake, third option that can go wrong, same thing here. He pushes me down. I still hold, hold the gun. Boom. Right in the face. As you can see, even if we're going to perform it again, even if I'm not going to fall, as I pop it up, he's going to pull. I still got the gun in my face right now. So all those three options of getting killed pretty much are coming from that wide stance. In a tactical thinking and a tactical decision, doing this can get you easily killed. All he needs to do is either kick, push forward, or push backwards. Okay, let's see what we can do to fix it and pretty much correct ourselves and we will see that I want to get more stable, unlike the other posture I was before, same thing, a straight gun threat coming from forward to, to, my forehead, to my forehead, instead of doing this that was wrong, what I want to do is step back and extend my hands. Again, start from the surrender position, maintain your arms not high, do it close. As I do this, I step back and extend my arms. Also by accomplishing this, I can get my attacker out of balance. Yet in the same time, I stay very stable on the ground. Okay, let's talk about also a common mis mistake we, uh, we've seen before that is uh, pretty much out there. Yes, I do step back, but look where my, my hands are, straight on the gun. Now, Mark here is a pretty strong guy. If I force him down and he forces me back, he takes me, pull me towards him, I'm exactly in the, his field of fire. From here and on, I'm not, I'm not going to make it. Okay, in order to understand the next technique, pretty much it's body mechanics. When I do this and I control the wrist, there is no way he can resist it. Mark resist, it's hard to resist just because I'm pressing the tendons right here, creating pressure, making it hard for him to contract his fist. By doing that, I will accomplish a less firmer grip, breaking his grip, and controlling the gun. Again, one more time. From here, dropping up. Mistake. He can force it. He can resist it. Pull back. Line of fire. From here, all goes straight to him. He cannot resist. Gun threat to the head from the front. Step back, hands pop up. Pressure right here on the tendons, just below the wrist. Gun is held firmly with my right hand. And as I go forward, creating a, an arch all the way towards him, pushing him down and forcing the gun in his face. Now if Mark is gonna insert his finger in the trigger, we also got a finger lock. If I'm going to squeeze hard enough, eventually he's going to release and discharge the bullet right towards himself. Again. Okay, in addition to a gun threat into the head, as Mark points it towards my head, the same thing. Pop down, reduce my height. Now, if I, if I held the gun firmly, the first round went off. But since I'm holding the slide, 
I created a malfunction because the extractor here of the chamber is jammed with an empty shell. From here, I'm just going to carry on with the technique as I did it so far. Create an arch, forcing him down by extending everything I did in the previous technique. Taking a control of his arm, ripping the gun out. Now, I still have to maintain control of my, atta of my, my attacker and take him down from here. For the sake of demonstration, I can do it on e every side, pretty much either it's clothes, holster, belt, with my rear sights, I'm going to shake the gun a couple of times and bring it back into an operating position. Okay, going back to understanding the weapons. From the minute I have a gun in my hand, it's nothing but a piece of metal if I never held one, let alone shot one. Okay, so if I never held or shot a gun, it's part of the studying and understanding of gun disarming. I have to go to a shooting range under a certified instructor and get trained. Understand the mechanism, shoot it, see how it reacts, how it feels. Once I get that, I will have a better understanding of the mechanism, meaning that I will have a greater knowledge of how to operate my gun. As you've seen before, I, ha I held my attacker in one hand before and using the other hand in order to control the weapon. Now, in order to do that, I have to know the principles of shooting and operating a gun single-handed. Let's say my other hand is occupied at the moment. I gotta know how to clear the jam. I gotta know how to clear the mechanism in order to make it active again, in order to make it possible to shoot with. I got rear sights on the gun. I wanna grab a hold, whether on a holster or on a belt or on any fold of my body, clearing the chambers and utilizing again. Now, in any case of malfunction, whether my hand is injured or preoccupied, I have to go in certain position to release magazines, reload magazines, recock the weapon and utilize it in any way or any threat, eliminate any threat that might come in my way. Okay, the second position is attack from, from the rear, attacking from the back. It's a very dangerous position because now I cannot really see fully my attacker. But I do have my peripheral vision. My peripheral vision helps me to identify whether he's holding a gun or just placing his finger instead of, instead of a gun. I need to see on what, which hand is he holding uh, the gun, maybe just putting his finger I need to see if he's serious, maybe it's someone I know, okay? Always as a guideline rule, if I'm going to turn to the right, I'm going to create a distraction by lifting my hands up and talking to the left. Now, he would probably expect me to turn this way, yet in the same time, what I'm going to do is talk to my left, slide my arm slightly, and pivot to the right. As you can see, I trap the hand on the wrist securing the barrel, pointing it to his face. From here and on, I can perform the strikes and punches that I want. I can tear the gun, head butt, grab knee, come back with a gun, come back with a gun retention. This would be performed from the right side. We also got the option to perform it through our left side. Now, pretty simple. If I perform it on the right side, I would talk with my head turning left. If I'm going to turn to the left side, just the opposite. I'm going to talk to the right. He would expect me to turn from here. Also, again, try to identify whether he's holding a gun and maybe he's holding it on his opposite hand. So as I look right, I turn left towards him, holding the wrist, nothing, nothing above it or nothing below it, securing the wrist, strike. Escort it with an elbow, secure the gun, getting the knee inside, striking, going back in a gun retention position. Okay, let's talk about a very important subject as part of, we got the technical part 
let's talk about evaluating the situation. Evaluating the situation is pretty much understanding the state of mind of your attacker to realize your own state of mind because a gun threat is not any um, bar fight or just a brawl or someone pushing you. It's an immediate, crucial, threatening, life-threatening situation. It's something that it's either you get out of or not, pretty much 50-50. That's why it's really important to evaluate your attacker's situation, his state of mind. Maybe someone pulls a gun at you. Hey, give me your money. Give me your wallet. Give me your watch. You give it to him. Sometimes it's, not, it's just not worth the fight. You know, everything can be replaced. Your life cannot be replaced. If your life is in danger, if your loved one's lives are in danger, then you got to operate. If you know the guy is just a punk that is looking to get some change or to get your wallet or your watch, just hand it over. If you see that the guy has got serious intentions, such as a terrorist attack, or the guy is really determined to kill you or create you any serious bodily harm, you don't operate, you operate, you do not think, you operate. And from that time on, everything is in one motion. Go forward, eliminate that attack. Okay, knowing the state of mind is also reading the body language, showing a, a signs of aggress aggressiveness, fear, intentions. Maybe the guy, like I said, maybe the guy is not want, wanting to kill you. Usually, people that are held at gunpoint is, are pretty much want something from you. In most cases, they want to take something from you. They don't want to take your life. Therefore, you've got to evaluate the situation properly. For example, if I'm stressed out or if I'm aggressive towards my attacker, that's why I told you, get your hands up. Don't get in a fighting position and don't get aggressive with your attacker because he might retaliate and more aggressive coming out of fear. A lot of psychology is, in, is involved with that. We're not getting into that aspect. But pretty much what we want to maintain is calmness. I want to be calm as, far, as much as I can be when a gun with a live round inside is held to my head or my body. I want to stay calm. I want to re remember my training. Before it's really crucial, we go through the technique and train a lot. Train them and train them and go over them and over and over and over until they're in our muscle memory and we just operate those techniques, perform the technique and execute them like they are second nature, like a reflex to us. I gotta maintain calm. You, got, you can go through practice a thousand times, but when it really comes to that, you have to stay calm and remember that there's only one shot. There is no second chance here. Also, we gotta identify, like I said, signs of aggressiveness at, with our attacker. Again, if he is determined to kill us, a suicide move like we discussed before might be in handy or necessary to perform and to save our lives or our loved ones. If not, let him go with the technique. Uh, let him, I'm sorry, let him go with, uh, with the money, with the wallet. Perform the technique and keeping the technique only for last resort. If I don't have any option, if everything else fails, maybe I can talk him out of it. Maybe I can just cooperate and save my life. If everything else fails, this is where those techniques are coming handy. That's why they are very risky techniques, but they've been proving to, proven to work in most cases. There's not, never 100%. But in most cases, if executed properly, if staying and remaining calm, you might have a very good chance of saving your life from a gun, attack, robbery, any weapon, assault, or intention to harm you. Okay, the next element is timing. Timing is everything. Everything in life, from crossing the road when a car passes, and if you're there and the, as the car passes, you're probably most likely going to get hit. Anything else, like in martial arts, whether you're doing boxing, jiu-jitsu, or any other thing in, in the fighting field, or anything else, timing is crucial. If you've got the proper technique, and you're not there, or your opponent is not there, it's not going to be of any effect. Okay, so the same thing even gets in few levels, increases when it comes to timing because it's my body reactions against the guy's finger. If I'm faster, and if I create enough of a distraction, evaluate my environment, evaluate the situation we just talked before, combining that with the proper timing, 
I might just be fine. Now, timing is everything. If I can get the proper distraction and the same time after I make my distraction, perform the technique, I have it. I gotta move smoothly, I must not hesitate. You must perform the technique, the same thing you train it over and over and over again. Once you got the timing right, everything else is gonna build up on it. From the first principle to the last. So time it, train it, and don't hesitate. If you are going to go for it, sacrifice and go for a technique. Do not hesitate in any given moment because there is only one shot. Okay, the next element that comes in, in handy that completes also, everything here as you can see completes anything else. Every stage is not going to be performed if you're not going to perform any other stages, whether it's before, like feel the fire, if nothing, if everything else is perfect but the feel the fire is not there, you're not stepping out, it's not, it's not worth it, it's just not going to work. Okay, so everything here, every step and every stage you're going to take is built, it's like a pyramid, built on top of it. Situa situational awareness is to being aware of what's around you. If, if I'm a law enforcement, for example, and I perform a gun disarming, I've got to make sure that I don't have any innocent crowd, civilians, standing in the way because it's not worth it if I perform and kill a few other people. By a misfire or... A, uh, a bullet that was discharged from, from the weapon. If I go, for example, with a kid, if I go with a girlfriend or, or a wife, I gotta take that under consideration. I gotta know my surrounding. If I can bring my attacker to an area that is safe by bringing my attacker, I mean not to take him physically over there, but just create a distraction or plan my next move in a way, if I can do this arm from that way, but I know that I got civilians, I got kids, I got a loved one in the way, I'm not gonna let him take the bullet. I gotta estimate that situation, evaluate it, and see if I can operate in a different, in a different mode. Sometimes I cannot. Sometimes I might be surrounded by the people. Not reacting could be also an option. Like I said, cooperating if it's a minor thing. Evaluating how serious it is. Maybe it's just a simple matter of, of, of a mug and you can just hand $20 and leave the scene. So evaluate the situation. Evaluate who is with you. Where are you stationed? It could be in a, in a place we've got bricks, so the bullet's not going to go through. If I'm in a, in a shack or in a, a wooden house, it might go through and hit someone in the next room. All the time I've got to remember my surrounding and be aware of what's in front of me, what's in the back, who is standing next to me, and evaluate the situation, and according to that, I'm going to act and perform. Okay, one of the last subjects we're gonna talk about is important nonetheless, like any other subject we just covered, is the post-conflict. The post-conflict is after the situation occurred, I took over the weapon, I got under control, I performed the technique, damage, injury, everything, any possible scenario you can think of might happen. Now, to understand and to cope with the post-conflict is very, is very important, very significant, especially living in the United States and any country that had got a firm law system, we have to deal with authorities eventually. Meaning is, if I face the police officer, if I face the judge, I have to know what to say and how to present it. Because if I use the technique and I harm my attacker in a way, I, me as a victim, I would not want to be presented as the bad guy eventually because I, after all, I'm the guy that just was under the attack, was under the threat. So I want to get out of the threat and phys from physical harm and also from lawsuits, lawsuits and, and any other problems I might have with authorities. Also, I gotta remember that after the post-conflict, in some cases, I didn't eliminate the threat completely or the guy just took off, changed his mind, and ran away. I have to make notes. I gotta make clear 
marks and very uh, significant marks I can see, for example, scars, uh, race, the color of the clothes, what was he wearing, if he had a, a shiny gun, if he had a dark gun, if it was a revolver, if it was a pistol, what was he saying, where was he running to? I mean, pretty much all of those factors, even if the guy is not here and is not under my control, help me and help the police to eventually catch up with the guy and please take him off the street so it will be a safer place for everyone. So also you got to remember at all times, practice those techniques. What you're going to train here is what you're going to perform outside. Don't expect to do it one time, it's like, hey, cool, it works. And then, it's like, I know gun disarming, I did it already. Practice those moves like, like a boxer practices jab, jab, jab all the time until he gets it right. You gotta train those techniques or they're even more complicated. And do it in a different scenario, different environment. Turn off the lights, do it in a, in a dark environment. Do it in, in an environment that is not flat, on a hill. Maybe you wanna do it in, in different sitting position. You wanna do it in a, in a car, in a plane, in any any place in any scenario, not just standing there and waiting for the attack. Scenarios that might be um, totally unprepared, sitting in a restaurant, sitting in any place you can think of that you would do or be in your normal life. Do not hesitate with those techniques. You've got to practice them smoothly and pretty much perfect because there is no second chance. If you're going to make a mistake on a gun disarming in real life situation, that might be your last mistake. Okay, one more factor, it's not really a factor that we can control, it's pretty much your luck. Okay, if you don't have a lucky day, you just don't have a lucky day. You could perform all those techniques, take, take a gun, disarm someone from your sleep. If it's not going to work, it's just not going to work, it might, it might be the luck factor. You can train a thousand times perfectly, by the time it really happens, there is no, it's not an insurance company, it's going to happen. And if, and if it's just meant to go wrong, it will go wrong. So there is no 100%. To increase all those, uh, your chances pretty much to survive, like I said before, is only to practice more and more. Don't forget repetition gets perfection. And um, I would like pretty much to sum it up in, in a way that you've got to remember all those six points, practice those techniques, make them a second nature, and pretty much... Uh, the Kapop system is the system that was born pretty much from nowhere in Israel. There is no specific founder. It's from a group of people that took ideas and tried those, those ideas pretty much on the battlefield and real life experience, paid with their own blood for a lot of mistakes. And from those mistakes, they learned and came up with those conclusions, pretty much what you see here has been tested. It's not by a specific founder, but there is few people in, in Israel that, like uh, Abe Glory, he's one of the first uh, Kapap original instructor. He's been a Palmach, he's a good friend of ours. He's been a Palmach instructor. Palmach is a, a, a resistant organization pre-IDF, IDF Israeli Defense Forces. So they were trained with minimum weapons to get maximum results. And from there on, it turned to be like like a thing that rolls and rolls and make an evolution and eventually grows up to be what it became today. And also today, there is no curriculum. It pretty much keeps on rolling with all the martial arts in the market. Everything is, that is good is going to be added to the system. Mistakes that are going to get discovered along the way are going to get eliminated by taking those techniques out. Everything that might be in handy is going to be to our use. Everything that is be could be for our disadvantage is going to get cut off. Those systems, our Kapop system is pretty much unique system as a CQB, a system that can be utilized in a street fight and a self-defense situation. Everywhere that we pretty much go, we're going to take it with us. Again, we got to practice other martial arts and practice the self-defense aspect in all of this. I'd also like to thank, first of all, Lieutenant Colonel Chaim Per 
from the Tel Aviv University. He's one of the first founders in anti-terror uh, CQB in Israel. He was in a special unit, Sayyidat Matkal. He was in charge of the hand-to-hand -hand combat over there. He is one of the uh, main founders that put a solid uh, foundation of uh, CQB training, Kapop, in Israel. We got Avi Nardia that I've been working with for many years now. He brought a lot of knowledge. He all the time makes sure that it's updated, learn from the mistakes, examine everything and every movement to the, the point of perfection. Also, I'd like to thank a good friend of ours that helped, it, that helped us during the entire process of bringing Kapop from Israel to the United States and start to establish a solid foundation. A good friend of ours is um, Sergeant Jim Wagner. He's the, currently the head instructor and the one that developed the reality-based training method that is being studied again all over the world and the United States right now. Helped us a lot from getting here to establish the system, hopefully to bring it to a larger crowd. I hope you like what you see today. Those techniques are tested from many, many generations and a lot of units. And with the time, like I said, made an evolution. I hope you learn a lot from what you've seen today. And also, I'd like to thank a good friend of mine, Mark, that took all the beating. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to go on the website. It's www.kapop.net. You can contact us. We're pretty much located right here in uh, the United States. And any questions you have for Israeli instructor, whether in Israel or in the United States, feel free to ask us. I hope you enjoyed this video. Keep it safe and train hard.